Okay, welcome to the exercise class. It's gonna be awkward with the mic, but okay, Ralph persevered, so I, I should also. Okay, um, so today, like we have a bunch of things to discuss. So first is, I mean, all of them, Ralph kind of gave you the preview already, but basically the first thing we're gonna extend our um, land arrow bound that, that we derived in a, in a lecture uh, last week to the case where we not only have a system and a machine at, at, which is connected to some, temp, uh, to some reservoir at temperature beta, but we explicitly have um, a car in our engine, namely we have, we model both hot bath and a cold bath and we see how it changes, then uh, again, just as Ralph reviewed in the end of the lecture, we're gonna see again the argument for the second law, um, just for some entropic considerations. Then quickly, I'm gonna talk about thermal bath uh, heat capacity as one of the small exercises. And finally, uh, the final exercise, which I will not go into detail, would be just to, um, apply the erasure protocol by Paul Skripczyk described in the lecture to a particular um, change of, of, a, of the state of the qubit and calculating the energy change and work in that case. Okay, so let's start with Landauer bound. And just to recap what we did in a lecture last week was the following. So we considered a joint system where we have the target system S and some machine part M, which is the temperature beta. And we consider these two jointly. And, uh, and we want to somehow, um, we want to perform a unitary on this joint system. And then we want to see what is the change of the entropy of the system S while performing this unitary and how it connects um, to, to the change of energy. Okay, uh, so the way how we derive it is the following. So the initial state is just a tensor product state between the state of the system and uh, the machine is uh, thermalized. Uh, it is in a connection or to, the, to a bath with a temperature beta. So the initial state is just the thermal state um, at temperature beta. Uh, and we also uh, perform a unitary U. on both of these systems. Uh, and after that, we would like to write the entropy change. Okay, so our proof or our derivation went in two steps. So the first step is that we write the sum of the in individual changes in entropy for both systems as the mutual information. So this is the change in entropy for system S plus the change in entropy for system M is equal to the mutual information between systems S and M in final state. And this is bigger or equal than zero just by the property of the mutual information. And the second step is this exactly equality form of the Landauer principle. So from this, we can derive that the following holds. So beta trace basically the of HM rho M minus rho, rho M prime. Uh, this, is, this is the change of energy just for the 
our system M minus B negative entropy change for the system S is equal to the mutual information between systems S and M plus uh, the relative entropy between the final and the initial states of the machine. Okay, so this was what we derived in the lecture. Uh, does everybody remember how the proof goes of this? Uh, how this was derived? So one way to see that this is true is, for example, just to take the right-hand side, uh, write both of these terms explicitly. So one term will be just this. Uh, for the mutual information, and then you write the relative entropy for the machine, for the initial and the final states of the machine, and then you also use the fact that the initial state of the machine uh, was a thermal state, which you know how, how it looks. So there is no problem there. Okay, and so in particular, this means that uh, the following inequality holds this is bigger or equal than zero uh, because both relative entropy and also the mutual information are non-negative quantities. And this means that this is, uh, the left-hand side is also bigger than zero, so we get that the change in entropy S of rho S prime minus S of rho S is bigger or equal than beta uh, trace of HM rho M minus rho M prime. Uh, what does it mean? It means that the entropy change of the system is bounded below uh, by the change in the er of the energy of the machine. So this is the basic Landauer bound. And uh, the exact form of how much the difference is in this case can be written explicitly as the sum of this mutual information and relative entropy. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is take this scenario and expand it a bit. So uh, now we're gonna have system S we're going to have um, two additional systems, basically forming a Carnot engine. This will be a cold bath at temperature beta R. And this will be a hot bath at temperature beta H. And we're going to consider this joint system. OK? Yes. Um, no, this is, this is, uh, all these bounds are for change of the entropy of the system. So basically, what it tells you, you can't, uh, you can't extract some energy from the from the machine uh, without uh, increasing the entropy of the system. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe my my notation is a bit different, but. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. I can't. I can't recall exactly which which type of setup uh, Ralph used, but um, 
yeah, this is this is a particular setup where where you where you look at the change of the entropy of the system directly with the connection uh, to another system which is uh, which is connected to above the temperature beta. So, and then you extract energy. Okay. Um, so now, basically, what we do. Ah, yes, because this is a cold bath and this is a hot bath, this inequality holds. And now we also consider that uh, the unitary that we perform uh, is energy preserving. So, R plus uh, HH is equal to zero. Uh, and now the question is, uh, how do we write uh, a bound for the, uh, now how do we write an explicit bound for the change of entropy of system S? And uh, the, the expressions that we're gonna use, so first we're gonna use delta S, we will denote the change of the entropy of a particular system uh, then we're going to use delta E, which is the change of energy of a particular system. We will also use the free energy of some system at temperature beta. And this is defined just by trace of uh, H rho. So just the energy of the system minus one over beta S of rho. So this is just the usual free energy F E minus D S as it is defined in thermodynamics. Okay, and uh, then we also will need a Carnot efficiency at eta between uh, these two baths, which is defined as one minus beta H over beta R. Okay, and now we're just gonna see a couple of equalities. And maybe as a preview, I'll just write the final, um, equation that we will find out. So one thing that we will find out is that the change of the free energy of the system S at temperature beta r is will be less or equal than minus eta delta e h. So basically it means that the energy extracted from the hot bath is uh, lower bounded by uh, the increase of energy uh, with the with the Carnot coefficient. And for the entropy what we would get is that the change of entropy for the system S minus beta H delta E S plus beta R minus beta H delta E R is bigger or equal than zero. So, So basically what we get here is um, the change of entropy is is bounded, is lower bounded by this beta H delta S minus beta R minus beta H delta E R, um, which reduces to the limits that we found out just with the machine, but without the cold and a hot bath in the case where um, when we take beta H to zero. So this is where in the hot bath is infinitely, infinitely hot. So in that case, we're just left with, so this is zero and we're just left with beta R delta E R as in a previous case. 
Okay, and the way this goes, sorry, um, is the following. Uh, so first, what one has to prove is that minus delta F of the system S at the temperature beta R minus beta delta E H uh, is equal to, so this is the exact equality, uh, one over beta change of the entropies individually of all three systems uh, plus the relative entropy between the final and initial states of the system R and the same for the system H. And here again, um, all these conclusions follow because this is bigger or equal than zero. Okay, and a hint here is to, instead of the mutual entropy between two systems, now use the mutual entropy between three systems. H prime, which is just the sum of the individual entropies uh, minus the joint. The entropy of the joint system. R H. And this is again always bigger or equal than zero. Also, additional thing that we know, same as in the previous case, the systems R and H, since they're thermalized with the uh, cold and a hot bath, baths uh, respectively, the initial state of all three systems is just a tensor product of the some state on the system S, then thermal state on the system R of temperature beta R, um, uh, tensor product, thermal state on the system S, sorry, on system H at temperature beta H. And I think I forgot a coefficient. So, yeah, this is beta R. Okay. <clears throat> so basically this is the equa equation form that we have to prove uh, out of which uh, we can make this this statement, which now, since we have cold and a hot bath, includes uh, the efficiency of the engine, um, the how much energy we can get out of the hot bath, and the free, uh, free energy change for the system. So while, while talking about these two baths, basically what we are trying to do, we have a heat flow between two baths, right? And then we try to extract some energy um, for our system from there. And then the bounds on, on that free energy as well as the bounds, corresponding bounds on the entropy change are given, are given by this. So to derive, for example, this, this bound from here, one should also use that the energy, the, to the net energy change is zero because the unitary is energy preserving so delta E S plus delta E R plus delta E H is equal to zero. And then basically you repeat the procedure that you've done, to, you've done in a part where we only have the machine because uh, 
you know exactly how the initial states of both cold and a hot bath look like. And hence you get this coefficient and also the efficiency, the ratio. Okay. So now uh, let us consider a special case of this scenario. So we are still considering the system S and a cold and a hot bath. Uh, but now let us consider that the system S is another even colder bath at temperature B, beta S, or it's connected to the, to the colder bath at temperature beta S, and we still have beta R and beta H. So now we have this. And now what we want to do, we want to cool uh, the system S even further. So just from, from your intuition, what does this setup remind you of? So we're using basically the say the, the Carnot engine to cool the, the system even further. So in the case, uh, so in the case, the case above was, was a bit more general. So we considered um, any type of energy change on the system S, but now we're particularly trying to cool it down. So which, which type of coefficient should intuitively arise in this case? So in, in the initial, in the case above, for example, the Carnot efficiency came up, and in this case, which coefficient should we see? What do you think? So forget about like quantum thermodynamics or whatever, just think about usual thermodynamics. We're trying to cool a system even further, and uh, for that, for example, we can use the um, inverse Carnot cycle, right? And this is used for refrigerators. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, cool the system S. And this is what is done in refrigerating procedures. And in that case, the, um, the Carnot efficiency for the fridge should come up. So basically, what you will get in this case is that, um, let us just massage this equation. So, delta SS minus uh, beta H delta ES plus uh, beta R minus beta H delta ER is bigger or equal than zero. Uh, to get my absorbent fridge uh, capacity, I will, I will add and I will subtract the beta S delta ES. So then I get delta SS plus beta H S minus beta H delta E S uh, minus beta S delta E S uh, plus beta R minus beta H delta E R bigger or equal than zero. Uh, you can note that delta SS minus beta delta ES is in fact just uh, minus beta S delta FS. So change in a free energy multiplied by beta S. And so what we get is beta S minus beta H delta ES plus beta R minus beta H delta ER 
of is bigger or equal than the change delta fs at temperature beta r, uh, oh, sorry, temperature beta s multiplied by beta s. So these are, uh, this is just equal to beta s delta e s minus delta s s. And uh, one thing, another thing we assumed here compared to the initial setup is that the system S is initially in the thermal state at the temperature beta S, which means that uh, the change of free energy uh, will always be uh, will always be positive. So uh, the the change basically because Gibbs state, the thermal state is uh, is a uh, minim has minimal free energy for uh, for given energy so uh, because of that if we if there is some change of free energy on on system s this is always going to be positive because it is a gibbs state And because of that, we get some bound on the ratio of changes of energy of the systems S and R, which is given by the ratio of beta R minus beta H over beta S minus beta H. And this is exactly the efficiency of uh, the absorption fridge. So it's just a fridge efficiency. Also in a classical case. So this is just an example of like how, um, what kind of transformations we have in, in mind and how we get the same results as like in a classical case with the classical thermodynamics and efficiencies also come up. Uh, yeah, so this exercise uh, in the exercise sheet, it's, it's basically adapted from uh, a Reben Wolf uh, paper. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it correctly, hopefully. Yes, Reuben Wolf, an improved Landau principle with si finite size corrections. I think Ralph sent around uh, a message on Moodle with different links to the papers. So if you want to hear the full argument, you can check it out. But basically the idea of all these setups is that uh, you try to, uh, you try to f find a bound on the entropy change or energy change or of, of the system uh, given, given the setup, the machine, or both cold and a hot bath explicitly. And the Landauer, Landauer bound in that case is just the explicit bound that you get for the change of, on the entropy of the system. Okay, is this more or less clear? The setups that we consider? Okay, I would, so I didn't do the derivation here because I think it's very repetitive and also basically the same as uh, was done in the lecture uh, because you just write these relative entropies explicitly and you substitute the entropies of the uh, initial states by their uh, using the fact that they're thermal states, and then you get the bound. Okay, but I would recommend you to at least go through it once. So. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna do 
we're going to derive or see the way to derive a sec the second law from some entropic considerations. OK, so one of the ways to formulate the second law is to say that, oh, we can't extract work from, um, from a heat reservoir at thermal equilibrium, right? So what we're going to do in this exercise is basically engineer such a situation um, in quantum thermodynamics, though. And then we're going to prove and we're going to assume that we can extract some uh, some work from 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 this heat reservoir, and then we're going to come to a contradiction. So, uh, basically, we'll have our heat reservoir. Uh, let's call it or bath. Let's call it B uh, at temperature beta B, and then we're going to have an additional system we call W. And this additional system, we will call it weight, or uh, also it can be called battery. And what it does is um, all the work that we extract in our scenario will be stored in that system. So uh, this is work storage. Indeed, it, it can be understood as some sort of battery. So uh, in any, any thermodynamic scenario where you extract some, uh, some work, you just put it in there, and then you can reuse it many times. And we're going to have a, some assumptions on, on this battery. So the first assumption will be that uh, the average extracted work is independent of the initial state of the battery or weight. And this is a reasonable assumption, which, I mean, we also do in our uh, daily life. So uh, irrespective of the, let's say, initial state of our battery charge of, of the phone, uh, we expect the battery to be filled like by 10% in, um, in some, in say like 10 minutes, maybe that's too fast, but still 10% in 10 minutes, irrespective of whether the initial state uh, of the battery was 10% or 20% filled. It also, makes sense because usually these systems are very big um, and the way the way our process works shouldn't shouldn't uh, rely that much on where exactly uh, how much how filled it is and the second assumption that we're going to make on the on this battery or weight is that all allowed unitaries acting on the joint system should commute uh, with a translational operator on the weight. So all unitaries acting on bath and weight should commute with this translational operator. So one can imagine that this battery, uh, the spectrum of this battery is just like um, a very big chunk of energies like uh, ideally infinite, just all possible energies. And then we can have this, uh, say, I don't know, could be minus as well. So say it's some E1. Uh, E2, um, or a EI and EJ. And then we have some, um, translation operator, which takes us from I to J. So 
And some overall ones. Okay, and for example, this one, we can also define this operator by just the energy change, right? So uh, gamma delta E is just sum over all energies. It shifts from the state of energy E to the state of energy E plus delta E. So for example, gamma A acting on the zero state of weight just brings it to uh, the energy A. And this is also a reasonable assumption because basically what we want these unitaries to do is just to, um, is not to, it's not about making um, some additional coherences in, the, in this weight, but just like shifting um, the energy levels of the weight according to the procedure that we are doing. And also another important reason uh, is to make this weight reusable. So we can use it in several procedures just like uh, we can use our usual batteries in several different devices and um, our kind of the result of using it shouldn't depend whether I uh, used it somewhere before or not. Okay, so the draft of the proof goes as follows. So as I said, it's gonna be proof by contradiction. So first we assume that there does, does exist a unitary and imp very important, we assume that the unitary is energy preserving. So we commute with the Hamiltonian uh, and we what we assume is that we indeed can um, extract some work from the ball and store it in, in our battery or work storage. Which means that the net change of energy uh, of, the, of the weight should be bigger than zero. Uh, if we have, this is the first step, so the net energy change of, of the weight is bigger than zero. This means that the energy change of the bath is less than zero because the total net energy should be, should be conserved, okay? Then the second, uh, the second question concerns the entropy. So how can I connect uh, the entropies uh, so first what is the net change of the joint entropy of the weight and the bar after performing this procedure so just just to give you a hint we performed a unitary on the joint system what would be the change of the entropy after performing unitary? Zero, yes, exactly. So this is zero, right? Uh, so what can you say then about the sum of the individual changes of entropy? Um, sorry. Uh, not necessarily. Yes, indeed. So, but for about the mutual information, you know, we know that it's always bigger than zero, right? So then we can write that. Uh, yes. 
Does it make sense? Also, like, I don't know if you had this in, um, yeah, exactly. So somehow, uh, the way to think about it is like the join states, the change of, of the entropy of the join state also contains some information about uh, the uh, the connection between two systems. So then if you just break it into individual individual ones, uh, this one should be less equal than that. Uh, yes, so for example, so you can see it in this way. Uh, even without like evoking the mutual information, uh, intuitive way to see that this is true is to just consider, so the joint state also contains information about correlations between these two systems. And um, hence the, like the, the joint entropy of these two states in the end uh, should be less than just if you break the state into two parts and they wouldn't contain that information anymore. But indeed, so, Basically, the mutual information between these two states is given by the entropy ah the other way around, yeah, so given by just the sum of the individual entropies minus this, and um in the beginning uh these the the joint their joint state is uh just a tensor product of two so the mutual and so actually then the joint entropy is just equal to the sum of two entropies but in the end uh, uh these two th this sum is bigger than this so this is for the final state and equal to zero to the initial state. And from this, you can get uh, that inequality. Is this clear? Okay. Um, very good. But we also know that delta S W B is equal to zero, right? So then we get that the sum of net changes uh, for systems W and B individually in entropy should be bigger or equal than zero. Okay. Uh, now, okay, this is a bit of a more tricky question, but what can you say about the change in entropy uh, for the system B individually? Uh, so we, we actually, I mean, the, the entropy of the system W can change. So, um, so for the system W, we don't know anything in particular, but one thing we know about the system B is that initially it is in a thermal state. And, uh, and basically as we start with the, and as we start with this thermal state, we start with the maximum entropy state for, for a given energy, which means that uh, the entropy cannot, uh, the entropy of the bath cannot increase. So delta SB should be negative. So this follows just from the fact that it starts in thermal state and the energy of the bath decreases. Okay. Uh, and then finally, what, what we will do is that we will find a particular type class say, of, of the weight, of the states of the weight, such that we can make uh, this 
and this value delta SW here as small as possible. And as Ralph said in the lecture, this will be true for so-called broad states. So if you consider, again, the battery as just like having this continuous energy spectrum, what we're gonna do, we're just gonna concentrate all states uh, in some region of the length L, let's say. So then I can write this as, in terms of this wave function, so I have E, W, D, E, where psi L of E would be just like this uh, big step of length L. So if we draw it around the zero point, so it's symmetric, uh, it is equal to the constant if E modulus is, uh, or let us just do actually for just square root of L, here we have L over two, and zero else. Okay, so we take this broad state. Um, and then after applying the unit, so initial state of the weight is just psi L, psi L. And after applying a unitary, uh, we use the fact that the unitary commutes uh, with the with this shift operators on the weight, which means that actually we can write the unitary in terms of uh, these shift operators, or we can, because commu commu commuting basically means that we can write them in the same, uh, there exists a same eigenbasis for both operators. So which means that Informally speaking, we can just write this unitary as a combination uh, of, of this shift, which means that the final state of the weight can also be written as a mixture of these shifts. So Eij, gamma Ei minus Ej, Um, uh, EJ minus EI. So this is just the um, emission conjugate of this shift. Okay, and now uh, there is a mathematical trick to, uh, to make an argument that this delta S can be as small as we want uh, in a case where we increase, increase this uh, the broadness, say, of this of the state of the weight, and it goes as follows. So, uh, we first compute the trace distance, which we label as d, between the final state of the weight and the initial state of the weight. So, and. What we, what we can write about this is uh, the following. So first, uh, we note that the final state of the weight can be seen as a mixture of these individual states, which we label as, let's say, rho i. And so, so rho i j. Uh, then this is the trace distance between sum over i j, rho i j, uh, P i j and rho w, and for uh, for the trace distance between the mixture, such mixture of the states, uh, and just one single state, it it holds that this is less or equal than uh, the mixture of the trace distances. So then basically you just need to compute the trace distance between rho ij and the initial state of the weight. 
And this is just one of the inequalities for the trace distance. Okay. Uh, and for this one, we can just use the uh, definition of the trace distance. So the trace distance between two, uh, yeah, in fact, now it becomes very easy because both of these states are actually just pure states. So uh, then the trace distance between two pure states can be calculated as square root of one minus the overlap between these two states. So you can compute that. Um, and then the next mathematical step is, let me use that board, is to use, is to use so called fans inequality. which connects the, the entropy change, uh, like the entropy change between two states with, their, uh, tra with the trace distance between them. So it says that the, um, the change of the entropy is upper bounded by d log d squared over D, uh, or where D is the uh, dimension, with small d is the dimension of the thermal systems which were used. But basically, using this inequality, uh, you can substitute D by what you, what you find using, just using that trace distance, and Using this uh, fans inequality, one can show that this uh, right-hand side can be as small as possible. And so this can be made, the change of the entropy of the weight can be made as small as possible, but the change of the entropy in the weight uh, does not affect, is not connected to the change of the entropy of the system B which means that if this can be made as small as possible, this is negative. It means that uh, net, net change of entropy, um, some of the individual changes of entropy should be less than zero. Uh, but here we find that they're bigger or equal than zero. And hence we arrive to a contradiction. So, uh, this is just the sketch of the proof. So like this is, this is not uh, kind of required knowledge. This is given as a hint. Uh, and this whole argument is taken from the paper by um, Paul Skripczyk, Tony Short, and Sandra Popescu, which is also cited in the exercise sheet. But the important thing to remember is generally how this argument goes. So we just prove it by contradiction. We assume that we can just use the bath and put some energy into the, into the weight. And weight has some restrictions on it. Uh, then we consider uh, the, how energy of the battery changes, or how energy of the bath changes. Then we, we consider how um, entropy changes for the whole system and for individual systems, then importantly, we use the fact that uh, the bath is in a thermal state, which means that the, its entropy change is negative. And then we construct such a state for, uh, for, for the weight, which, um, which we, of which the entropy change of which, for which we can make as small as possible. And, you don't, you, you don't need to remember the exact way of deriving why this has to be as small as, why, why this can be made as small as possible, but just when you take the, but basically the state for which 
uh, this holds is uh, this broad sampling of the energy. Okay, is this argument clear? Yes. Uh, this one or? Ah, this is not a relative entropy, sorry. This is how I labeled the trace distance. Uh, I should have probably chosen a different uh, notation. Let's say this is T. No, the idea here is that because there is this Fans inequality which, which bounds the change of the entropy uh, of, this, of the state uh, by the trace distance between the initial and the final states, uh, that's why we're interested in looking at the trace distance. So the trace distance for two pure states is defined like this. Okay. Okay, if this argument is more or less clear. Then, uh, one final thing, which is, or like two final things, and then you'll be free. So first one is just the heat capacity. of a thermal bath. So we have a system in a thermal state, tau, at temperature beta. Uh, now, the question we ask, I mean, it's a classical thermodynamics question as well, what is the heat capacity? And let's define the heat capacity as um, uh, yeah, I guess the easiest way is to rate of change of beta uh, by the rate of change of energy, how much energy we put in into the bath. Then this can be written as just dE uh, by d beta to the power minus one. And Now we can write the E in terms of uh, our temperature beta and the energies of the levels. So let's say that tau of beta is E to the power minus yeah, beta H over the Z. So this is going to be some e to the power minus beta e i e i e i over some over e i e to the power minus beta e i. So then the energy of the state would be just given by e i e to the power minus beta e i. Okay, and now we just take the derivative. Of this with respect to beta. So then we get that this is sum over E i. E i uh, minus beta e to the power minus beta E i. Uh, I must have forgotten something because this is too simple. Ah, yes, I've forgotten the normalization. Okay, so it's not only this, we also need to normalize. So Okay, and now we can take the derivative. 
which is, so we take the derivative of the top, which is just sum over EI minus EI squared e to the power minus beta EI. I'll call this Z, I already call it Z, minus, uh, now I take a derivative of Z, which is sum over I E I e to the power minus beta E I and multiplied by the nominator, which is the same thing. So we get squared and in denominator, we just get Z squared. Okay, uh, so what do we get here? Is the following, so ah, and here we get the minus, so hence this is will be with a plus. So we get the average energy squared. Uh, yes, indeed. So let us first massage the first term. So the first term um, is sum over i minus e i squared e to the power minus beta e i over z and plus um, e sum over i, e i, e to the power minus beta e i over z squared. And this can be just simply written as, so the first one is the average of the square of energy And the second term is the average of energy squared. So we actually get um, minus the variance. And so we see that the heat capacity of such a path can just be written as the um, inverse of, of the variance in energy. Uh, so the, in the exercise, you also have to repeat this procedure for the case where we have n identical uh, thermal baths and temperature beta. And in that case, uh, the, the thermal capacity that you should get would be the thermal capacity of one bath uh, divided by n. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's it's a different definition. Um I mean Kind of because in, in quantum thermodynamics we mostly work with betas, right? This is this is an, just an easier quantity to use. Uh, but of course, because you know the connection between T and beta, you can also just um, take the derivative, like take the derivative of this, like of uh, beta with respect to. So, for example, if you if you want to define your kappa okay, u as dt d, you can write this as in this way, right? So then you can just multiply this. Uh, so first substitute beta in this expression with one over t, and then just add the derivative of t with respect to beta and uh, that we know, right? So. This will give you a one minus one over beta squared, 
which will be minus t squared. And then what you would get is just minus actually will cancel out and you will get t squared multiplied by the variance in energy. Yeah, so actually like it's, let us just um, write the final expression that we have, right? So we have heat capacity, which is uh, the inverse of this, which means it's uh, minus one over Uh, this is the variance in energy, and this has to be a positive, um, uh, yeah, value. It has a positive value, which means that this uh, this heat capacity, as we define it, has negative value, which makes complete sense, because uh, you pump in some energy into your system, and so the temperature of the system should increase, which means that beta should decrease. So in this case, this is exactly what we see. So we pump in some energy and uh, because of the negative heat capacity, yeah, the beta, the beta decreases. Yeah, so yeah, there are like different ways to define heat capacity, but uh, as long as you know how your definitions for temperature are connected, then yeah, you can always convert one to the other. Okay, and one final thing uh, before I finish is the following. So it's actually the first exercise in the exercise sheet, but it just simply um, consists of applying the protocol uh, that you've seen in the lecture uh, to a particular setup where we have some initial state of the qubit uh, which is diagonal with p and one minus p and we want to convert it to also diagonal states but with q and one minus q. So it's not like entirely erasure, but let's say partial erasure uh, of the qubit. Okay, and uh, the protocol that we've seen in the lecture basically takes this qubit uh, and takes a collection of qubits with increasing energy gaps uh, from the same bath. And then the protocol consists of swapping uh, the, this qubit of interests with the with each bath qubit in the succession, and this protocol is also uh, considered in detail in the lecture notes. Uh, and here you would need to apply the protocol to take the system S from the in it, for, from initial state to the final state, and importantly, you need to calculate the work. Uh, which is done in this protocol. Let's say that you take n qubits from the bath with linearly incre increasing energy gaps, then the work, the total work will be um, sum on the individual works done in the energy changes in the individual uh, swaps. And then you can also, you can uh, lower bound this work uh, by by smoothening the whole procedure to an integral. And this is basically what you will have to calculate. Uh, and then after calculating that, you can just compare it, uh, what would happen if you would just perform one qubit swap. So just use one qubit such that uh, uh, this initial state would be transformed to this final state, which means that you just need to swap with a thermal qubit of this of this temperature, and then compare the work costs for both procedures. But basically, this exercise is there for you to um, take that erasure protocol 
uh, explicitly and calculate the costs involved in there explicitly. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I've, I've talked about everything I wanted today. Uh, this is also the last exercise class on thermodynamics. So, um, and also last exercise class for me before, uh, before the end of the semester, we'll be doing some exercise classes on clocks. So the next one will be with Victor, who is sitting there in the back. And that will be on measurement theory. And after that, um, on marginal problem and non-locality. And I'll be back with clocks at some point. <laughs>